When working with vectors in n-dimensional space, it's useful to give every vector some size. This is most often done by associating to each vector the distance of the origin to the endpoint. We call this the Euclidean norm, but this is not the only way we could assign a size. Instead, we could sum all of the absolute values. This is the distance of the origin to the endpoint if we are only allowed to travel parallel to one of the axes. We call this the taxicab norm. Yet another way to assign size is by associating to each vector the maximum of the absolute values of its components. All of these constructions assign in some way a size to each vector. They also have certain desirable properties, which we will summarize in the definition of a norm. First of all, they're always non-negative and zero if and only if x is zero. Additionally, you can pull the multiplication by a scalar out of the norm. So the norm of a scaled vector is the same as if you scale the norm by the absolute value of the scalar. This is called absolute homogeneity. The third property is that norm of the sum of two vectors is not greater than the sum of the norms. This is called the triangle inequality, as it essentially says that the one side in a triangle cannot be longer than the sum of the lengths of the other two sides. We call a function on a vector space over some subfield of the complex numbers that satisfies these properties and norm on that vector space. As the name already suggests, the Euclidean norm, the taxicab norm, and the maximum norm are norms on the n dimensional Euclidean numbers. In order to understand these norms better, let's look at how the unit sphere looks like with these norms. So we look at all vectors with norm 1. For the Euclidean norm, this is a circle. For the taxicab norm and the maximum norm, it's a square. Now one might wonder whether there are any other norms for the Euclidean vector spaces. It turns out that all the norms we have discussed so far are part of a larger class of norms called p-norms. They are kind of in between the taxicab norm and the maximum norm. We define the p-norm of a vector to be the sum of the absolute values of the components raised to the pth power and then take the pth root. This forms a norm for p in between 1 and infinity. When we look again at the unit sphere, we see that these p-norms are in between the norms we have already defined. It is not trivial to see that the p-norms really are norms, but we will prove this in a generalized setting. Each n-dimensional vector can be interpreted as a function on the set of integers from 1 to n, to the real numbers. Let's call the set of integers from 1 to n xn. We may turn this set into a measure space with a counting measure. As integrating with respect to the counting measure is the same as summing over the entire domain, we may write the p norms in integral form as follows. In this form, the question naturally arises whether we are able to generalize this construction of norms to general measure spaces. The definition of a p-norm for p greater or equal to 1 but not equal to infinity is exactly as we might expect. For p equal to infinity, the situation is more subtle. Ideally, we want to define the norm for all measurable functions. As these functions can be very discontinuous, the behavior on some null set should not influence the norm. That's why we define the supremums norm to be the infimum of all constants, which bound the function almost everywhere. As a norm must always be finite, it makes sense to define these p-norms on the space of measurable functions such that the p-norm is finite. But are these functions we call p-norms really norms on those spaces? And are the spaces we define even vector spaces? Let's try to verify this. The absolute homogeneity of the p-norm simply follows by the homogeneity of the integral for p lower than infinity. For p equal to infinity, it is also simple to see that the supremums norm is absolute homogeneous. Thus, we may scale any function in these spaces, and we'll get another function in the same space. To verify that we can add two functions, we argue by the convexity of the function h on the positive real numbers. Convexity means that whenever we draw a secant of two point of the graph, the secant is always above the graph. Using the convexity of h, we obtain an upper bound for the absolute value of f plus g to the pth power. After integrating this, we see that the p-norm of f plus g is finite if the p-norm of f is finite and the p-norm of g is finite. In the case of p being infinity, we get by the triangle inequality of the absolute value, the triangle inequality of the supremums norm. This establishes that the spaces we look at are indeed vector spaces. So now we want to know whether our p-norms are actually norms on these spaces. We have already shown the absolute homogeneity and we have shown that the supremums norm satisfies the triangle inequality.
so let's try to prove the triangle inequality for the other p-norms. As this is a bit more complicated, we first will look at Young's inequality. Let's suppose we have a continuous strictly increasing function, then the inverse exists. Let's plot the integral of the function up to a point A. Then the integral of the inverse complements the other area. When we fit a rectangle into the graph, we see that the area of the rectangle is smaller than the other two areas combined. This remains true when we change A or B. Summarizing, we get that A times B is less or equal to the integral of the function plus the integral of the inverse. Let's take a look at a special case of this, where we have two numbers between 1 and infinity, such that their reciprocals sum up to 1. Two such numbers are called conjugates. Then we can define f by this formula, and after some calculations, we get the inverse of f. When integrating, we get that a times b is less or equal to a to the pth power divided by p, plus b to the power q divided by q, for a and b positive. This result is called Young's inequality. With this inequality, we can prove a fundamental inequality in measure theory, the Holder inequality. We are given two conjugate numbers, where we consider 1 and infinity to be conjugate. Then for any two function of the corresponding spaces, the integral of the absolute value of the product is lower or equal to the product of the p and q norms. Holder's inequality is used to prove the triangle inequality for p norms as we will see. So how do we prove this? First of all, notice that if the p norm of f is equal to zero, then f must vanish almost everywhere. So f times g vanishes almost everywhere, and the integral 1 the left side is equal to zero. The same argument applies if the q norm of g is equal to zero. So let's assume that the p norm and q norm are positive. By Young's inequality, we obtain we the following inequality. By integrating and rearranging, we obtain Holder's inequality. Finally, we are able to prove that p norms satisfy the triangle inequality. This result is called the Minkowski inequality. Now let's prove this inequality. We do this by introducing the conjugate to p and using the Holder inequality. To conclude, we have shown that the p norms are non negative, absolutely homogeneous, and they satisfy the triangle inequality. So, in order to show that the p norm is a norm, we just have to show that they are zero if and only if the function is equal to zero. This property does unfortunately fail in general. As if f is zero almost everywhere, the p norm is also zero. To describe this better, let's define a semi norm. It has the same properties as a norm except that it can be zero for non-zero vectors. As a norm is generally better to work with in a semi-norm, let's try to modify our vector space over which we define the p-norm. We are going to identify the functions in this space if they are equal almost everywhere. We can do this by taking the quotient space of the functions, whose p-norm is equal to zero. In this new vector space, the elements are equivalence classes, but we're going to regard them as functions nonetheless and just keep in mind, that two functions are equal in that space if they are equal almost everywhere. On this space, our p norm is a norm. The space we have constructed is called LP space. They are very important in functional analysis in various other disciplines, as they have many good properties. We are going to look at three important properties to showcase this. First of all, the LP spaces are Banach spaces, which means that they are complete with respect to the p norm. So any Cauchy sequence in a LP space converges with respect to the P norm. However, this does not mean that the sequence also converges pointwise. Fortunately, we are at least able to say that there is a subsequence that converges pointwise almost everywhere. Another property is that if the measure is sigma finite and P is not equal to infinity, we can describe the dual space of the LP space very well. To do this, we need the conjugate Q of P. We can then define for any function in the LQ space, a functional TF on the LP space. These functionals are not just a subclass of all the functionals, but instead all of the functionals are given in this form. Additionally, the implied isomorphism is also isometric, so the norm stays the same. This result allows us to understand the dual space of certain LP spaces very well. Finally, let's look at the special case where P is equal to 2. Then P is its own conjugate and the L2 space is a Hilbert space, so we may define an inner product, which induces the norm. Then the Holder inequality is here called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and bounds the inner product by the norm.
We know far more about Hilbert spaces than about Bonnock spaces, so the L2 spaces provide many techniques to understand a function better, once we have shown that the function is in an L2 space. In the next video, we will take a closer look at Hilbert spaces and the special case of L2 spaces. So if you don't want to miss that, consider subscribing. Thanks for watching.